Morning, everyone. Uh, this is a welcome to the Judiciary Committee hearing for this Friday morning. My name is Carl Rhodes. I'm the chair of the committee. This Zoom meeting and YouTube live stream event will include the following agenda, our 9.30 a.m. JDC agenda for to consider House bills. The other members of the committee uh, are Vice Chair Jarrett Keokalole, Senator Laura Ocasio, Senator Mike Gabbard, Senator Chris Lee, Senator Donna Mercado-Kim, who I think is excused today, and Senator Kurt Ravella. This meeting, including the audio and video uh, remote participants, is being streamed live on YouTube. You will find links to viewing options for all Senate meetings on the live and on-demand video page of the legislature's website. Oh, and Senator Kim is here. For you. Thank you. Glad you could join us. In the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to major technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Tuesday, March 23rd at 10.05 a.m. and a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For the people testifying remotely, all testifier audio will be muted and video disabled until it's your turn to testify. There is a two minute time limit for testifier and there's a countdown clock that you can watch as you testify. If there are temporary technical glitches during your turn to testify, we may have to move on to the next person due to time constraints. We appreciate your understanding and remind you the committee has already received your written testimony and we will try to come back to you if, if can. I'll be reading a list of people who testified written, who submitted written testimony for each measure. We apologize if the closed captioning doesn't accurately transcribe the names. If you're interested in reviewing the written testimony, please go to the legislature's website, www.capitalwithano.y.gov. You'll find a link to the testimony on the status page for the measure that you're, the measure or measures that you're interested in. And okay, so I believe that's it. Members uh, and and people attending, I was unable to print something that I usually print. So I'm gonna to have to be switching back and forth. So uh, it may be a little slower than usual, usual. So just bear that in mind. And first up today is HB 490. HB 490 lowers the age at which enhanced penalties apply for crimes against seniors from 62 to 60 and makes commission of certain criminal offenses against the senior's person or property applicable if the perpetrator knows or reasonably should know the senior the senior victim's age. First up on HB 490 is Ali S. Hayakawa for the public defender. Hi, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, <laughs> members of the committee. Uh, good morning, uh, my name is Lee Hayakawa. I'm appearing on behalf of the Office of the Public Defender. And the Office of the Public Defender respectfully opposes in part and supports in part HB number 490. We will be standing uh, uh, on our written testimony and I'm available for questions. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Next is uh, Carolyn Kadirao uh, for the for Department of Health, Executive Office on Aging and Support. Um, Michael Kunishima for Honolulu Police Department. I don't see him. Uh, HPD is in support. Robert Rivera for Maui Department of the Prosecuting Attorneys. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Committee Chair Senator Rhodes, as well as Vice Chair and, and the other members of the committee. Uh, we were the ones that authored this last year, and we did make that significant change where we removed the strict liability portion of this bill. And as uh, Mr. Hayakawa stated, the, the standard now is um, the age of the uh, victim is known or reasonably should have been known to the offender. Uh, we believe and we're hoping that this will uh, provide greater protection for our seniors who have been targeted more so in the, in the past year and a half, um, as well as deter those who do target our seniors for property crimes as well as crimes against persons. Uh, I'm, I'm available for any questions should there be any from the committee. Great, thank you. Next up is uh, Paul K. Ferreira for the Hawaii Police Department in support. Um, HMS APCS, Lisa Amador. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, and Committee members, Lisa Amador, right. Adult Protective and Community Services Administrator. DHS stands on our written testimony. Uh, apologize for the late submission and I'm available for questions if you have any. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And that was in support. 
Uh, next is Mary Gilmeister for testifying for MACA in support, Michael Gloyer Sr. in support, Lynn Murakami Akatsuka in support, Beverly Gatelli in support, Dar Carlin in support, E. Ileino Funakoshi in support, uh, Mark Tom or Scott Spal Spalina for Honolulu prosecuting attorney. I don't see them. Okay. I'm so sorry. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Deputy Prosecutor Trisha Nakamatsu appearing on behalf of the Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office. I'm sorry, Scott Spalina, the head of our Elder Abuse Division was supposed to be here, but he's having some technical difficulties right now. Um, if for now we could just stand on a testimony and allow him to, I think he's trying to jump on. Okay, still. thank um, you. Allow it a minute, thank you. And next is Kathy Betts, Director for DHS, also in support. That's all the testimony we have on HB 490. Members, any questions? Okay, let me see. Okay, I don't have any questions either. So we'll uh, thank you testifiers for being here and we'll go ahead and move on to the next measure, which is HB 566 relating to abuse of a family or household member. I'm this sorry, here to interrupt. Yes. Um, rather than deal with the technicalities, I just asked Mr. Oh, Spolina. Right. To yeah. we'll, we'll back up. Go ahead, Mr. Spolina. Hey, Chair. Um, a little over a year ago, I actually was over there at the Capitol testifying for this um, and advocating that it be passed. Um, a year later, I'm doing this by Zoom because the world has changed in that year. Uh, over a year ago, Oahu was seeing an increase in violent crimes against seniors. We had a lot of purse snatchings going on. We had um, this crime going through the roof. And that's one reason that I was strongly advocating for this bill. In the past year, the world has changed except for elder abuse. Elder abuse is still happening. Um, people are still being targeted because of their age. We're still getting um, more violent crimes happening to our seniors. The state's hope in this bill being passed is that it'll send a message that to leave seniors alone, to leave anybody that even looks like they're old alone. Um, if you mess with them, you're looking at felony charges. If you target them, you're looking at jail time. If you steal from them, it's a serious crime now, not just something where you're gonna get slapped on the wrist and then go away. Um, seniors need to be protected because right now they're being targeted and um, the office of the Honolulu prosecutor's office feels that this bill will help uh, put a warning sign instead of a target sign a warning sign over a senior saying don't mess with them the word is going to get out on the street criminals talk to criminals um, and they'll realize that hey if you even look dirty at a senior citizen you're going to get in big trouble. And so I hope that uh, this board will consider passing this bill to the next stage because the seniors of Wahoo need it. Thank you very much. Thank you, members. Any questions for this testifier? If not, well, thank you very much uh, for being here, Mr. Spolina, and we'll go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is HB 566 relating to abuse of family or household members. This adds course of control between family or household members to the offense of abuse of family or household members as a petty misdemeanor. Uh, first up on 566 is uh, Darcia Forrester for the uh, Office of Public Defender. Uh, Aloha Chair Rose and members of the committee. Um, my name is Darcia Forrester. I'm with the Office of the Public Defender. Our office strongly opposes House Bill 566 HD1. We have outlined in our written testimony a number of serious issues we have with this particular measure. However, I would like to highlight that we do have constitutional concerns about the overbroad language 
um, the overbroad definitions and the overbroad scope of this measure based on the current definition of coercive control. We strongly urge this committee to look closely at the definition of coercive control in HRS section 586-1 and review our written testimony. We did provide numerous examples of how a law abiding citizen can get caught up in the criminal justice system and accused of a crime, the crime of abuse based on behavior that perhaps should not be criminalized. We understand the intent but this measure as currently written or using the current definition may criminalize normal disagreements that family and household members have. We are also very concerned about the ease that this measure as currently written may be used as a weapon to further establish power and control by an abuser over a person who's already experiencing abuse. Um, thank you and I have, I'm available for questions if needed. Mahalo. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up is Landon M. M. Murata, Deputy Attorney General in opposition, Angela Mercado for State Hawaii State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Good morning. Can't hear you. I can see you, but you can't hear you. Okay, there you go. Uh, good morning. Um, Good morning, Chair Rhodes, Vice Chair Koho Kalole, and committee members. I'm Angelina Mercado with the Hawaii State Coalition Against Domestic Violence and submitting testimony and support for this measure. Um, I know that there has been some concerns about the um, broad nature of the definition, but we can tell you on behalf of our survivors that, who have been victimized by name calling and isolation that this is a very real way to be victimized and many survivors are not subject to a lot of the physical violence and bruising that may be presented to programs and to the core and to law enforcement. And I also wanna call attention to the very fact that the concern that the community has for survivors of domestic violence during this pandemic is the very fact that they are being um, at home and potentially isolated from their resources, family support networks. And this is something that's not new. The pandemic has not really brought this on. The pandemic has already highlighted something that's existing and very real for survivors of domestic violence. Secondly, I would also I would also invite the committee to look at the fact that the CDC takes very, very serious um, the definitions of coercive control, including name calling, isolation, et cetera. And it become, it's actually something that's very much studied and has a lot of de um, resources dedicated to them. And finally, as we are receiving stimulus payments throughout the country, we know that financial control is often something that's used when there is an attempt of power and control. And we're very concerned about survivors whose stimulus payments may be got from them by their abusers, which is again, falls under the definitions uh, included in the state. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide testimony and here for any questions you may have. Great, thank you very much. Uh, next up is Youngji Overly for AEUW of Hawaii in support, Nancy Creedman, Domestic Violence Action Center in support, Lori Fields, Planned Parenthood Votes Northwest in Hawaii in support, Michael Goyu Sr. in support, Thomas Farrell Esquire in opposition, Dara Carlin in support, Mark Tom, Department of the Prosecuting Attorney for Honolulu. And or Ms. Nakamatsu, go ahead. I'm sorry, filling in for Mark Tom, uh, Trisha Nakamatsu, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney, Honolulu Prosecuting Attorney's Office. We'll stand on our written testimony. While we support the intent, we do have concerns about the language. Available for questions, if any. Thank you. Uh, let's see, who's next? Randall Platt, testifying for Honolulu Police with comments. Carrie Ur Urasevich uh, for Early Childhood Action Strategy and Support. Patricia Bielik, in support. That's all the testimony we have on HB 566. Uh, members, any questions? Chair, we may have um, Deputy Attorney General present for testimony. Uh, is the Deputy Landon, Attorney... Landon Morata. Go ahead. Good morning. I, I, I apologize. I am present to testify on another bill. We submitted written testimony only on this one, but I'm available for any questions. If okay. Anyone... okay, great. Thanks. Okay, members, any questions on 566? Okay, let me see if I have any. 
Nope. Okay. If there are no questions. We'll go ahead and move on to uh, HB 891 relating to electric guns and regulate the sale and use of electric guns and cartridges. Uh, first up on 891 is Amy Murakami, Deputy Attorney General. And good morning, Senator good Rhodes and members of the committee. The Department of the Attorney General strongly supports this bill. Um, the purpose of this bill is to protect the health and safety of the public by regulating the sale and use of electric guns. The constitutionality of Hawaii's electric gun bill was drawn into question by the United States Supreme Court decision in Cayetano versus Massachusetts. And there is a currently a pending lawsuit in the United States District Court for the District of Hawaii in which um, the party is seeking to invalidate Hawaii's electric gun, gun ban. The passage of this bill is necessary to protect public safety. The bill repeals Hawaii's ban on electric guns and creates a regulatory scheme that restricts the use of, of electric guns to self-defense, defense of others, and protection of property. It requires sellers of electric guns to be licensed, conduct a criminal background check on buyers, and keep records of inventory and sales. It prohibits persons under the age of 21 from owning, possessing, or controlling electric guns, and it creates criminal offenses for the use of, and possession of electric guns in a commission of a misdemeanor or felony. Uh, the department asks the, the committee to pass this bill, and I am available for questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is... Dave Nilsson uh, for Honolulu Police Department. Major, I, I can't remember. Assistant Chief Major, I can't remember, sorry. <laughs> That's Major, sir. Thank you very much for the almost promotion. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chair Rhodes and members. Uh, David Nilsson, Major of the Records and Identification Division at Honolulu Police Department, City and County of Honolulu. Uh, the HPD supports House Bill 891. Uh, as amended in HD2 relating to electric guns, uh, we greatly appreciate the House and the Senate working to remove some of the provisions uh, that would have challenged us significantly. And we think that this is a good way to start with this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is uh, Paul K. Ferreira for Hawaii Police Department in support. Uh, Elliot K. K. for Kauai Police Department in support. Andrew Namiki Roberts for the Hawaii Firearms Coalition. Good morning, Chair Good morning. Committee members. Um, my name is Andrew Namiki Roberts. I'm a director for Hawaii Firearms Coalition. Um, I'm also the plaintiff in the lawsuit against the state to overturn their ban on electric weapons. So I'm very familiar with these weapons, I'm very familiar in how they work and what our current laws are and how these laws that are being proposed will affect law abiding citizens. Um, the background check system that they're trying to put in place doesn't currently exist in a method where outside organizations such as gun stores or those wishing to sell them will be able to access that system and use it correctly. Um, there's also an issue with regards to how that data is transmitted um, to these gun stores. There's a lot of confidential and um, private information that's included in a background check that is not needed to be seen by a third party um, when police departments do these background checks there's a lot of regulations that are in place that protect that privacy there's also a lot of regulations that are in place for example with the firearms um, background checks as to who can see that data and how it's shared now you're talking about transmitting that data to a private organization that can then do whatever they want with that data um, the background check system wouldn't work in itself because these arms are readily available online. You can buy these right now from China or from third party sellers in the mainland, have them shipped to Hawaii with no regulatory need. Um, right now, if you go down to the swap meet at the Honolulu uh, Stadium, you can buy tasers and stun guns at the swap meet today with no regulations, even though they are illegal. Um, having this background check system, this registration system, and these permitting systems that have been proposed in place will do nothing to deter crime. Um, these arms are designed for self-defense. A taser pulse, the civilian model of the taser, is a single-use weapon that's designed for somebody to use in self-defense. And once you pull the trigger, that's it, it's done. Um, in fact, it's so 
often used in this method that the company that manufactures them will replace your taser pulse for free if you have a police report. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, next up is um, Todd Yukutake. Is, yes, he's signed up. There you are. Good morning. Uh, morning, committee. Uh, chair, vice chair, uh, Todd Yukutake, and I oppose HB 891 and request amendments. Uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with this bill, uh, but overall on the mainland, you can purchase a uh, taser or electric gun online, and I have it in my testimony too, uh, through Amazon and have it shipped to your door uh, with no restrictions in almost all states. Uh, but I'll just go through some of the problems I noticed. Um, First of all, the most glaring one is electric guns cannot be used by other people for protection. Only the owner can use it. So let's say uh, there's a home invasion at your house. Uh, you're not home. Your spouse is home and there's a taser on the table. They cannot use it to defend themselves according to this, to this uh, law. Also, those under 21 uh, cannot use it either. And they're the ones who are probably the most uh, needed the most because... Uh, when they're out in public, a lot of them don't have cars. They might catch the bus to work, to school, walk to school. Um, through high crime areas, they won't be able to buy a taser because of this bill. Also, this bill does not address uh, carry in public, which is very important. That's where you see all of the, the carjackings, the sexual assaults, all of the crime in the neighborhoods and in the city. Uh, this would, might still be considered a um, deadly and dangerous weapon per HRS 134-51. So uh, please address this in this bill where you can carry it in public uh, because of the rising violent crime out there. Uh, let me see. Electric guns are safe. Um, I was tased for HPD training at the HPD Academy. My entire class of, I think there were about... Uh, 30 of us got tased as part of training. So uh, we got tased. Uh, we fell to the ground, got back up perfectly fine. So they are safe to use. Thank you very much. Next is um, Marcus Tanaka. Oh, hello. Good morning. Um, uh, I stand by my testimony and I'm um, just wanting to reiterate that if you're going to make something legal, because courts ruled you have to make it legal. The whole concept should be make it legal, but not, let's make it also, let's regulate it heavily. Let's make it, let's regulate the sellers so they have to jump through a lot of the hoops. You know, the point is taser should be legal. Um, like the pre, like Todd mentioned, should be able to buy it on Amazon, have it shipped to my door with two day prime shipping. Um, whoever's, I give permissive use to should be able to use it as well, not only myself because I bought it. Um, you know, so that's about all I had. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see who's next here. Um, Brian Isaacson in opposition, Rita Kama Kimura in opposition, Eric Kanashiro in opposition, Christy Guzman in opposition, Joel Berg in opposition. Vanel Puros in opposition, John Abbott in opposition, and George Pace in opposition. That's all the testimony we have on 891. Members, questions? Um, I have a question Good. for Senator Major. Cassio, go ahead. I have a question for Major Nilsson if he's available. Maybe, oh yeah, there he comes. Yes, okay. Hello, Here we are. Major. Thank you and good morning. Um, I just had a question. Um, can you give information as to your understanding of tasing minors? Uh, or maybe effects? Tasing and, minors? Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't believe I understand the question. Uh, are the, like, for example, are there different effects on minors? Uh, and, and also maybe even from, from your, the perspective of um, the police force uh, using tasing on minors. 
Uh, that is um, unfortunately outside my area of expertise. I would have to reach out to the, the training academy that does our, as our subject matter experts on that. They might be able to answer that question. If you would like, I can get back to you on that, Senator. Okay, thank you. That would be great. But I uh, understand if it's beyond your scope. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Members, any other questions? Uh, if not, Major, I have a question for you too. Um, Sir? So I'm, I'm assuming that uh, there's no personal registration requirement in here because the counties felt like they couldn't keep up. Is that is that basically the, uh, the counties uh, running the registrations uh, uh, would overwhelm uh, our system because it would be the same system that we used to register firearms because the original mm -hmm. bill mirrored that procedure. Uh, in the bill, there's um, as written now uh, in the HD2, uh, there's provisions where the licensees that sell the uh, sell the tasers, will provide lists uh, to the counties once we license them of who uh, has, uh, has uh, purchased a taser and gone through the taser class from the licensee. Okay. So, I mean, it's, this doesn't, cons I mean, in a perfect world, would you want to register uh, electric gun owners? Personally, sir, when I looked at how other states do it, there are 37, 38 other states that have actually no restrictions other than you have to be 18 or in some states 21, I believe, uh, to have a taser. Mm -hmm. um, Probably. I, yeah. I, 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 my bosses would have to answer that. The Attorney okay. General would need to weigh in on that, sir. I'm a little above my pay grade. All right. Uh, on a, a question for the, uh, I think it's Amy Murakami, to with the department of uh, yeah there we go i couldn't see your full name there um so uh, as a the hd2 the question was raised about concealed carry is are the concealed carry laws that apply to regular firearms apply to uh, electric guns as well they were not put into um they were not mirrored into this bill so the firearm Concealed carry restrictions are only to the firearms. Um, previous testifier reference 134-51, but the anticipation is that is going to be in a separate section and generally um, because the electric guns were, are in its own section, the anticipation is that would not apply that there was not an intention. So that was, that was but in the, in your original draft, that was the case too. You're, you're okay with having, I'm just, I mean, I, I'm just trying to figure out whether, right. is that something that you would prefer to, that it concealed carry apply or does it, you think it doesn't matter because it's not as lethal? It's electric guns are not as lethal. Um, and for, many like stun guns, they would have to be carried in a purse or otherwise, you know, um, not an open carry. Mm -hmm. So that was the um, consideration that was given to that matter. Okay. Uh, then the, I guess the other, only other question I had was there is a provision in the bill, uh, the HD2, about internet sales. So internet sales will be subject to this bill, correct? Correct, because it's the um, bill itself says any sales that's intended to be in um, Hawaii. So an internet, how, how would an internet seller deal with that? They could still get a license to sell in Hawaii and go jump through the and do check the boxes for for sales here. Is that the way it would work? That that would be the anticipation and the um, the bill itself does anticipate it by stating that while a store in Hawaii would have to have a physical copy posted, internet sales would have to post it on their website that they do have a license from Hawaii. Okay. And then one, uh, just one, uh, just a question about the status of the lawsuit that Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see your full name either, Nam Namiki. What's, what's the status right now? Currently, it is pending in the federal district court. Um, the proceedings were stayed for um, 
the young case to be decided. There's an, another firearms case that mm -hmm. is pending in federal district court. So um, the federal court said that they were staying. In. How are those two cases connected? They're both regarding firearms. Since the electric guns um, touches upon the second amendment, the young case is about concealed carry in Hawaii. Oh, okay. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I remember. Okay, I didn't know that's the name. I knew there was a case. I didn't know what it was called. I'm sorry. Okay. Members, any other questions? Yeah, Chair. I, I have Sheriff a, Favella, go ahead. Or uh, HPD, or maybe if you can answer the question. Yeah, the question um, that I have is that in the uh, since uh, we have the stun gun or electric guns um, in Hawaii, <clears throat> how much um, unlawful uh, usage that you think that we had over the years? It's not a significant amount, Senator. Oh, uh, to, to, to my knowledge, it's uh, I, I know personally of, of no cases where, where tasers have been used, but I'm sure there have been some instances, but it's uh, right now it's it's not it's a negligible number. <clears throat> Thank you. Chair, the only, the only reason why I guess um, I guess I can I talk to uh, I guess Amy. Sure, go ahead if you're still here, Ms. Morikami. There we go. I'm sorry, Senator. Uh, could you repeat the question? Uh, the, well, the question was about the crime, but what I wanted to ask you is that there's a lot of people um, in Hawaii, especially with all the heavy, heavy gun restrictions and gun laws, and a lot of families that is afraid to have firearms in the house. Um, this is an alternative for them to have uh, a non- so-called non-lethal weapon for protection um, for their family or for themselves. Um, having this heavy restrictions, I just wanted to know, that's why I asked HPD and I guess you, same question. Why Why is it so um, much so that you guys wanna, I mean, what, what, what prompted this heavy restrictions and registrations if we're not having an overwhelming um, unlawful use of an electric or a stun gun? Well, until recent, uh, well, currently we have a total ban. So it's hard to say what would suddenly occur if the ban is lifted in its entirety. Yes. I think there has been a couple of very recent um, incidents where stun guns were used illegally in the commission of crimes. So there are um, public safety issues that this bill tries to balance with people's right, as you say, to use a electric gun for self-defense. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, thank you. Members, any other questions on, uh, on the electric gun bill? Okay, thank you very much all the testifiers who are here. We'll go ahead and move on to HB 895 relating to credit for time of detention prior to sentence. So we'll clarify that defendants may not earn credit on a sentence imposed for a subsequent conviction for time being served on a previous felony conviction. Um, first up on 895 is Landon Murata, Deputy Attorney General. Morning, Chair Rhodes and members of the committee, Deputy Attorney General Adam okay. Roth on behalf of the department. The department is in strong support of this bill. The uh, department submitted written testimony in support and would I'd like to highlight the main thrust of our testimony uh, to the members of the committee is that in 2012, when the subsection three was first passed, it's pretty clear that the intent of the legislature was to ensure that defendants who commit crimes while they are serving a sentence don't get credit for time served pending, basically pending trial on their subsequent offense um, when they're sentenced. This would avoid the issue, the, the situation where someone's already serving a sentence and they can commit however many crimes without any type of um, accountability or uh, um, 
punishment. So the bill that's been introduced solves that problem that was created when uh, the Supreme Court in State v. Abihai ruled that subsection one still controls and that, that that defendant will get credit in spite of subsection three. So it clarifies that subsection one, uh, notwithstanding, the defendant will not get credit. Um, other than that, I think that summarizes the testimony and I'm available for any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, let me see who's next here. Um... Uh, William Bento, uh, Department of Public, Harp, oh, suddenly can't speak English, Department of Public Safety. No, sorry, State of Hawaii, Office of Public Defender, my bad. No problem, thank you very much. Small. Need new glasses, I guess. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rhodes and members of the committee. Uh, my name is William Bento. I'm a member of the uh, Public Defender's Office. Um, we oppose this bill, and in our written testimony, we outlined three reasons, and I'd just like to highlight those. Um, <clears throat> Deputy Attorney General Murata did uh, uh, talk about the Abihai case. One of the things that, there, that was said in Abihai is that um, we have constitutional questions that come up when there's a conflict in, in the Section 1 and Section 3 as well as constitutional issues dealing with giving a person credit for the time that they have earned while incarcerated. And so, first of all, uh, subsequent to Abihai, the Supreme Court decided a case called State versus James Thompson. And in that case, they clearly stated that, uh, that there can be a violation of double jeopardy when you deny a person their pre-sentence detention credit then sentence that person and make that person serve that same period of time over again. In other words, they would be serving the same period of time in jail twice. And so the, you know, the common usage of double jeopardy is you don't put a person on trial twice. But in reality, it's also mean, it also means that you cannot punish the person twice for the same offense. And changing subsection three uh, as proposed in the bill would do so. Also, it has a chilling effect on a person who requests a jury trial because while they're waiting for their jury trial, they're not receiving any credit and this could take months if not longer at times. And so some people may give up their right to a trial just to get credit. And lastly, in Abihai itself, the court said that the rule of lenity, if there's an ambiguity between subsection one and subsection three, has to um, be ruled in favor of the defendant. So even if Great. this change occurs- Thank you very much. Next up is uh, Max Otani for the Department of Public Safety in support. Next is Office of Hawaiian Affairs with comments. Next is Wendy Hudson for, the, for Hudson Law LLC in opposition. That's all the testimony we have on HB 895. Members, any questions on HB 895? Um, uh, Chair, Senator Ocasio, go ahead. I have a question for D Deputy Attorney General, if available. Um, yes, Senator. So currently, judges um, do do they currently have discretion to order consecutive sentencing when when for for crimes when someone is not in jail? Yes, they can. They can at sentencing on the substantive uh, offense run that term of incarceration subsequent to the prior offense. Mm -hmm. And then this measure would re would uh, remove judicial discretion, correct? No. I'm sorry? No, sorry. The, the, the court can still run the terms consecutive. What, what this measure does is say, because you're already serving a sentence and you were serving that sentence when you committed your subsequent offense, you're not going to get credit for the times where you're serving that sentence on the new offense. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Members, any other questions? If not, thank you very much, testifiers, for being here. We'll go ahead and move on to the next bill, which is HB 1107 relating to computer crime adds aggravated harassment by stalking to the list of offenses upon which the offense of 
of use of a computer in the commission of a separate crime may be based, provides the court with the discretion to require the forfeiture of property use in computer crimes if the perpetrator was a minor, regardless of whether the minor owned the property. First up on 1107 is Brooke Connor or Ms. Dr. Christina Kishimoto for the Department of Education. Aloha Chair Rhodes, committee members. This Morning. is Brooke Connor, I'm the CIO for the Department of Education. Uh, we will stand on our written testimony offering uh, comments on this measure. We're available for any questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, next is Darcia Forrester, Office of Public Defender. Aloha, Chair Rhodes and members of the committee. We uh, did submit some comments. We'll stand on our written testimony, but we do acknowledge the change has been made to allow for some discretion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next is uh, Michael Kunishima uh, for Honolulu Police Department, I believe it's captain. I don't see him. Uh, let's see, they were, HPD is in support. Michael Galoyo Jr. for the LGBT Caucus of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Senators. Thank you uh, on behalf of the, Michael Galoyo on behalf of the LGBT Caucus and the Democratic Party of Hawaii. We thank you for hearing this bill. Uh, we we understand we want we know that it's time that to uh, bring our laws up to what is needed with regards to cyber bullying we believe that this does this it doesn't create a pipeline uh to prisons for those and it gives a way for to address cyber bullying and uh cyber stalking so we encourage you to pass this bill and mahalo for hearing it thank you uh next is Dara Carlin in support. And that's all the testimony we have on HB 1107. Members, any questions? Chair, um, let's see. Sure, Kasi, anyone is here. I was just curious if a judge already has the discretion to take a computer, but I'm not sure exactly um, on this who would. I don't know. The Department of Education might know. I don't know. Um, Mr. Connor, are you still here? Uh, I am. I am still here. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm not a lawyer and uh, a master of the, the section of the, the law. Certainly, um, a school could restrict access to um, a computer for a student. They couldn't seize the students or their family's computer. Um, we could certainly prevent access to school systems for somebody in a bullying situation. And that's something that the schools would do there as well. I believe the um, statute on seizure of property is fairly broadly worded in the case of, of convictions. Um, but um, again, I'm, I'm not the, the expert on that area. Senator Casio. Yep, thank you. Okay, any other questions members? Okay, let me look down my list here. Okay, okay. Uh, if, if there are no other questions, let's go ahead and move on to uh, HB 1326. It allows a narrow hearsay exception for statements made by domestic violence victims during the course of the first interaction with the responding law enforcement officers and before the arrest of the defendant, as long as the statement bears sufficient indicia of reliability. First on 1326 is James Sabi, uh, the public defender. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, uh, good morning to the members of the, members of the committee. Uh, the alleged statements, the alleged victim statements about a domestic violence incident made to the police officer responding to a domestic disturbance call uh, and the purpose of the police officer being there is to investigate the crime will never, will not survive the confrontation clause of the uh, Hawaii constitution as well as the federal constitution. I think it's, it's outlined in my uh, written testimony. Uh, so even if this exception is created, no judge should be allowing the statement to come in. 
Uh, it just can't survive it because you can't legislate what testimonial is. It's uh, testimonial is grounded in the constitution. There's an analysis, there's a test. I believe the uh, judiciary, the evidence committee, standing uh, evidence committee has also submitted testimony. And I just want to note the members of that committee are um, not just judges, uh, they're prosecutors, uh, law professors, as well as esteemed uh, prominent members of the, uh, of the bar. So um, I think we're all in agreement that, I mean, I know the reason why this wants it to, these, uh, people want this to be passed, but it's just not going to work. And it's, uh, I just can't see how it's going to get admitted into evidence, any of those statements. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is uh, Ka uh, Judge Catherine Migio for the state of Hawaii judiciary in opposition, Dara Carlin in support, and Gerard Silva in opposition. And that's all the written test, that's all the testimony we have. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Tabe? Um, I guess I have a question for you. So, I mean, or my understanding is Oregon has a similar uh, hearsay exception. And has it been challenged? Has it been upheld? Do you know? It hasn't been challenged yet. I don't know how often they use it. Uh, it seems like if the state constitution allows it, the federal constitution shouldn't allow it uh, because it's pretty straightforward at this point. But there are there are other except. I mean, there's a whole list of hearsay exceptions, of course. Uh, right. But some of them apply to con the right of confrontation, don't they? Right. Uh, they do. It's it depends if it's test if it's yeah, see, if, if they're available, if the witness is available, if the witness is at court, the statement may come in we could, for, for impeachment purposes or whatever. But there's, if the statement is deemed what we call testimonial, then the witness needs to be available for the defendant to cross-examine and confront just, that person. Just, isn't this a situation where the declarant is for all intents and purposes not available because they're in fear of their life? No, there's no, now there's an exception if there was some wrongdoing by the defendant, you know, threatening That's, them. There's, right. there's exception, uh, but see, it depends if the, if the statement is testimonial, they, they have to be there because otherwise we're going to have situation where a person could get convicted without even seeing their accuser in court you know that's just that's not how our system was you know this uh well people 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 plead guilty all the time without seeing their uh right well that's because they decide to give up those rights you know yeah, when you plead okay. guilty so i don't know um, it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't seem as it, it compared to your testimony it just doesn't seem like as big a stretch to uh to call someone who's been in fear of their life not available uh, we'll see. I mean, obviously, the courts, the one, if we pass this, the courts are the ones that get to decide it ultimately. But uh, I, I don't know. Members, any other questions? Yeah, yes. Senator sure. Favela. Uh, maybe I need a little bit of clarification. Um, so let's just say right now I'm, I'm in a, involved in a domestic violence and I'm assaulted in my home and I press charges and it goes, person gets arrested and go all the way and then. I decide to drop the charges. Don't the state just automatically take it over anyway? Yes, the state takes it over and they oh. will, uh, uh, well, the state it takes it over and it's up to the prosecutor to decide to whether to continue it or not. Yeah, it so. depends. I mean, it, it, depends it, it, on it's out of evidence. your control. It depends on whatever ev other evidence the prosecutor has. Yes, I agree. It's out of their control, but it, if, if they're the only witness, which is often the case in these kind of domestic violence situations, then the case is usually dead. So I'm sorry, go ahead, Senator Favela, more questions? Okay, thanks. Okay, members, I think that brings us to, thank you, to, uh, Mr. Tabe, for joining us today. Um, I think that brings us to the end of the testi testimonial part, speaking of testi testimonial uh, statements. Uh, let's see, do we have quorum? Senator Kim, are you here? Ah, okay, here's Senator Lee. That gives us quorum. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm ready to go ahead and make um, 
make recommendations if, unless unless someone has a desire to go into the breakout room. I convinced okay. the boss last night to the big bosses. So for me, I'm a little salty today. But uh, I'm sorry. I, who's I'll this? Say, okay. <laughs> um, so, I think, Senator, it, it might be a good idea to go into a breakout room. This is Eileen, and, yes. and and right before Jesse was speaking. Okay. I was um, not speaking. Thank you. Do we need to go into the breakout breakout room? I, I don't. So uh, Eileen or or Jesse, do we need to go into the break breakout room? I think it's helpful. Okay. I did not request that. Um, I. Okay, well, let's go into the breakout room for a second. Um, Leving, I guess you're with us today. If we could go to the breakout room. Okay, welcome back to the Judiciary Committee this morning, this Friday morning. Uh, we'll be doing voting voting on those measures that were on our uh, 930 agenda. First up is HB 9, I mean 490. This lowers the age at which enhanced penalties apply for crimes against seniors from 62 to 60, makes commission of certain criminal offenses against the senior's person or property applicable if the per perpetrator knows or reasonably should know the, the senior's senior victim's age. Uh, recommendation on 490 is to path with some amendments will restore the language that protects an individual receiving case management management services in a, in a hospital health care provider's office or in a home i think it was an i think it was a, just a mistake on the in the the house draft and this restores it to the original intent of the law and then we'll also make it effective upon approval questions or concerns if not uh, senator lee is kind is being kind enough to take votes for us today Thanks. Voting on HB 490, recommendation to pass with amendments. Chair? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair is excused. Senator Ocasio? Uh, reservations. Um, Senator Gabbard excused. Uh, Senator Kim? Aye. I'll vote aye. And Senator Favela? Aye. Chair, measure adopted. Thank you very much. Next up is HB 566 relating to abuse of family or household member. This adds course of control between family or household members to the offense of abuse of family or household members as a petty misdemeanor. Uh, recommendation here is to pass with some amendments. Uh, like we did with the Senate version, we'll add this um, course of control element to the Act 19 that was a um, pilot program that we passed last year. And so it will it's, um, expires in uh, less than five years now and we'll also make it effective upon approval questions or concerns Senator chair, thank you chair Rhodes. um i do have some large concerns with this bill although i do wholeheartedly understand the intent and want uh you know to work towards protecting um victims in abuse situations um i want to make note that that even the attorney general is opposed to this bill, uh, being that it's the behavior listed in their quote, not suited for criminal pros prosecution, and also to really address the vagaries in a lot of the language. So, mahalo. Understood. I, it's, of course, on, in this committee, we ignore somebody's advice every single time we vote. Yeah. So that part of it yes. doesn't particularly bother me. Yeah. Um, but this is this course of control is is a real thing and uh i it is difficult to get at and so the bills that we use to try to get at it are also difficult so this is you know this is a pilot program if it if it crashes and burns then we won't we won't yeah. read up uh when the time comes but and just to ex uh to explain myself also is that i come from the perspective of um uh not so much adding to more criminalization, but rather looking at it from a place of, uh, of uh, you know, um, rehabilitation and support to begin with. So that's a lot of also where my, my vote is coming from. Okay. Uh, Other concerns, members? If not, Senator Lee. 
Thank you. Voting on HB 566 HD 1 recommendation to pass with amendments, noting excused absence of Senators Keohokalole and Gabbard, as well as the reservations of Senator Casio. Are there any other reservations? Any no's? Reservation. Reservations Actually, for Senator. Um, I'm sorry, mine's a no vote. Oh, my apologies. Uh, no for uh, Casio, WR for Favela. Anyone else? If not, chair recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 891 relating to electric guns. This regulates the sale and use of electric guns and cartridges. Our recommendation here is to pass with a couple of amendments. We'll have technical amendments and then we'll make it effective upon approval, but with an implement date, implementation date of January 1, 2022, so that the, um, the counties can get their forms and stuff together. Questions or concerns? If not, uh, Senator Lee. Voting on HB 891 HD2, recommendation to pass with amendments, noting excused absence of uh, Senators Kehokalole and Gabbard. Are there any reservations? Any no's? If not, chair recommendation is adopted. No, no vote. Oh, no for Senator Favela. Yes. Reservations. And reservations for Senator Casio. Okay. Recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next is HB 895 relating to credit for time of detention prior to sentence. Clarifies that defendants may not earn credit on a sentence imposed for a subsequent conviction for time being served on a previous felony conviction. Uh, recommendation here is to pass with technical amendments only. Questions or concerns? Senator Lee. Uh, voting on HB 895, recommendation to pass with amendments, noting excused absence of Senators Kiyohokalole and Gabbard, are there any reservations? Any? No vote. No for Senator Favela? No. And Senator Acasio. Uh, if no one else, then chair recommendation is adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 1107 relating to computer crime. This adds aggravated harassment by stalking to the list of offenses from which the offensive use of computer and the commission of a separate crime may be based. And it provides the court with the discretion to require the forfeiture of property used in computer crimes if the perpetrator was a minor, regardless of whether the minor owned the property. Uh, recommendation here is to pass with technical amendments. Questions or concerns? If not, Senator Lee. HB 1107 HD1, recommendation to pass with amendments, noting the excused absence of Senators Kiyohokalole and Gabbard. Are there any reservations? Reservations. So noted. Any no's? Reservation. Okay. Uh, noting the reservations of Senators Casio and Favela, recommendation adopted. Thank you. Next up is HB 1326. This allows a narrow hearsay exception for statements made by domestic violence victims during the course of the first interaction with responding law enforcement officers and before the arrest of the defendant, as long as the statement bears sufficient indicia of reliability. Our recommendation here is to pass with an amendment and just making it effective upon approval. Questions or concerns? Senator Casio. Chair Rhodes, thank you. I will be voting in opposition to this based on um, uh, my understanding of the constitutional conflict. And also, yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? If not, Senator Lee for the vote. HB 1326 HD1 recommendation to pass with amendments, uh, noting excused absence of Senators Kiyohokalole and Gabbard as well as the no vote of Senator Acasio. Are there any other reservations? Reservation. No vote. Uh, so noted on both Reservations. Counts. Yep. Reservations for Senator Kim. Uh, you got my no vote? Uh, yep. Yep. Yes, no vote for Senator Favela. Okay. Otherwise, recommendation is adopted. Thank you very much, members. So that's it for today. We're adjourned. See you in session. Mahalo.